All right. Um, I always hesitate to say it's going to be a shorter sermon than usual because every time I say that, I end up putting my foot in my mouth and it ends up being way longer than I expect. Um, I don't have a lot of scripture to turn to, but I do have just one real simple concept that I think is very important to, to preach uh, just periodically. Again, this isn't some brand new thing. Don't, don't expect coming in here to just be like blown away with some some new revelation on the scripture. This is a very simple concept. But it's a very important one. It's a very important one for our church to thrive. And the title of my sermon is Grace to Grow. And what I want to do, we're going to get to Galatians 6 in a minute, but um, what, what I want to make sure our church has, and I think we've done a really good job so far, but obviously there's always room for improvement, is um, having the right spirit within our church. Because there's a lot of different doctrines and it's, and it's hard for me as a pastor, I need to try to balance everything appropriately and preach on the right subjects and make sure that the truth is being preached no matter what and without holding back and, and not shying away from it. But I also need to make sure I don't just spend too much time focused in one direction that we kind of get a lopsided view of, of how we should be living our lives and how this church should be run and, and things of that nature. And what I want to preach on this morning is just the, uh, allowing, you know, grace and long suffering, especially to people within our church. As our church grows, we're going to continue to see people that are at all various levels in their spiritual life. You have people that hopefully are just brand new saved. They got saved a week ago, a month ago, a year ago. You know, then you have people five years, 10 years have been saved. Some people have been going to church longer than others. Everyone's going to be at a different stage in their growth. And we need to remember that, especially as you continue to grow spiritually, you need to remember that not everybody is where you are and you can't just expect people to be where you're at right away. We need to be able to have grace, compassion, mercy, especially within the church so that, you know, people aren't starting to feel like they're, they're, you know, not welcome here, even though they're trying, even though they're, they're coming to church, they love God, you know, but maybe they're not spiritually as far along as you are. We want to make sure that, that we're doing a good job. And, and what I'm going to start off with before we even get into Galatians 6, where I started, is because um, this ties in completely with the Matthew 7 Bible study on, on not judging. And I spent a lot of time in that sermon explaining just because of the culture we live in where people are supposed to say, oh, judge not, you can't judge anything. So I spent a lot of time explaining that, yes, we can judge. It's right to judge. As Jesus Christ said, judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. So I, I spent quite a bit of time just kind of explaining that and preaching that. But at the same time, I don't want to just let that get too far to embolden people to start getting a self-righteous attitude into thinking, you know, that you can just start judging everybody for every little thing and kind of have a more judgmental spirit about you. While yes, it is, it is uh, right and appropriate in, you know, many times to judge and we're called to judge, we still need to make sure that we're not just, just lifting ourselves up and getting this holier than thou attitude. I'm gonna to get to that in a minute also, but um, what Jesus said, and I just quoted the verse in John 7, 24, judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. Oftentimes people can, you know, a, a situation can look a certain way on the surface. And you might be tempted to judge somebody just based on what you see in a very short period of time. But you don't really know any of the backstory behind that. You, you don't know what else someone might be dealing with, what else is going on in a person's life. You just get one snapshot and you feel like, oh man, can you believe so and so? And, and this is what Matthew 7 is actually warning about. Right. This is one of the things that's saying, you know, hey, with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. You don't always know what is going on behind the scenes. Let's say, here, here's, I've, I've got a lot of examples of this to try to help people understand because all too often, I think people can listen to sermons. 
And they can agree with everything that's being said and say, amen, yeah, that's the truth. Yeah, preach it, brother. But then they walk away without ever checking themselves and to see if they may be guilty of the very thing that's being preached. And that is very important that we always self-analyze and say, you know what, Maybe, am, am I allowing this, the, you know, a, a judgmental spirit to just kind of permeate and, and be a little overwhelming? Or am I, am I judging things according to the appearance and not really understanding what's lying beneath that? In the context of John chapter 7, they were criticizing Jesus Christ for healing on the Sabbath day. And he, he explains to them, he's like, hey, if, if in order to keep Moses' law, you have to circumcise a child on the Sabbath day, well, that's, that's doing work, isn't it? And he's, you know, he's basically saying, why are you being critical of me for healing on the Sabbath day when there's this other work being done, but that's not going to be criticized? They weren't judging righteously. On the surface, it's just, hey, you're doing work, you can't do that. But the righteous judgment, just taking the, whole, the thing as a whole and understanding everything that's going on and understanding the whole of God's law and, and recognizing, well, there is an exception for someone getting circumcised to keep the law of God. Well, there's also an exception for doing the will of God by healing somebody and making somebody whole that, yes, that is allowed on the Sabbath day. That, that God doesn't expect somebody to just lie in a ditch and die because it would be work for me to go and lift him up out of the ditch and bring him home and like bandage up his wounds and, and feed him something. You know, that's not what the scripture was talking about. So you need to judge righteously. But let's get a little bit more um, into, into a few examples here because there's, there's a lot of things that I've just seen commonly in general and just years of going to church or years of being in churches. Churches are full of, of people, and you know what? We're all sinners. Nobody's perfect. And when you get a larger, and, and the more people there are, there are going to be issues. There's going to be problems. There's conflicts of personality. It's going to happen. Okay? I get that. But we want to do the best that we can to try to prevent any problems so that we can have unity within the church, so that we can all be in one place, in one accord, here to serve Jesus Christ and to do that will and to try to make sure everything goes as smoothly as possible. So um, I've got a really good example of someone, you know, people judging when it's not... Uh, they don't really know the whole story or judging hypocritically. And um, one thing that people will tend to do is they'll often judge what they would do in certain situations where they perceive someone else as failing, right? So you look at someone else and, and you see, oh man, they're doing a terrible job. Now, that's not always, that's not a wrong thing or a bad thing to be thinking because you're, you're always judging everything. I mean, you're going to be judging right now what I'm saying. Hey, is this making sense? We're always going to be judging. So I'm not saying not to do that. That's not the bad thing. The problem comes in, though, is when you make an unrighteous judgment because you don't really know the story and you're just being too quick to judge. And especially then when you let that come out against the other person, you start maybe speaking against that person when you really don't even have all the details of the story. Uh, Oftentimes, I'll see people, you know, a perfect example is uh, people who don't have any children at all start judging parents and people that have children that you have no idea what it's like to be raising kids and raising a family, and especially when you have more and more children. You know, a lot of people have no clue what goes into that and what it's like. But I mean, I don't know how many times you hear young couples and I probably did the same thing like, oh, well, when I have kids, I'm not going to let my kids do this, this, this and this. There's actually a real funny video. I, I was with my family quite quite a while ago. Still, it was a really old video. We were going through home home movies. Right. And and I, I it was a time where we was like I was, as a family, we we're going back through old home movies. So I was already an adult, probably in my 20s, at home, pulling out the VHS tapes, you know, getting, they were recorded on, on the camcorder on like family vacations and stuff. And we found this one video and 
at the time of the video, I was, in, I was a teenager. I was like in high school. And I had this haircut where my bangs were like really long. It would like come down to here and it was all slicked back, but then the sides were all shaved around. So it was like a really stupid haircut. And my uncle was recorded on the video going, Oh, I'll never, I'll never let my son have a, have a stupid haircut like that or something, something, something along those lines. Right? I'm, not, I'm not quoting him verbatim. But at the time we were watching this, his son had then become a teenager and <laughs> had almost the exact same haircut that I had in that video. And it's just, it's one of those things, right? It was obviously, it's comical, it's funny, we all had a laugh about it. It's not really that big of a deal, right? But it perfectly illustrates how many people can just start having this judgmental attitude. Well, you know what? He didn't have a teenager at the time. He didn't know what it was like and dealing with, fine, if that's what you want, if you want to look stupid, go ahead and do it, right? Whatever. <laughs> Parents have different reasons for, for making the decisions that they make, and oftentimes you don't even realize what's going on. Now, that being said, I also want to make sure you know, this doesn't, you know, if something's wrong, it's wrong. I mean, if something's wrong according to the Bible, you know, you may, it's not like, well, understanding the full backstory is going to change whether something is right or wrong. I mean, if someone's just in sin, that's wrong. Okay, so that's, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about people just committing a sinful act and just saying, well, that's, I mean, yeah, that's wrong. That's the judgment. And if that's what God's word says, then yeah, we're not going to go against that. I'm just talking about some other situations where, you know what, it's better to have the full story. And if you don't, then just let things go, you know, especially if they don't really affect you. When it really doesn't matter what other people are doing in their house, with their wife, with their husband, with their family, with, you know, some decisions that they make on their own, there really is no reason to just be looking at other people and judging their lives. Let them be. That's, you know, and, and if people can do that a little bit more, everyone would get along. Um, you know, another example, I, along the same lines, you know, people who are single judging people who are married, people who are, you know, non-parents judging parents. There's so many situations you simply don't know what it's like to be in without having been there yourself. So just be careful with that type of a judgment. Um, and like I mentioned before, you know, everybody's going to judge in their mind and you ought to do that. But the problem comes in is when you have a, like a, a holier than thou attitude towards people. Now in, in Galatians chapter 6, the part of the chapter I wanted to look at real quickly is uh, in verse number one, the Bible says, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. This is the attitude that the church ought to have. If there's somebody that's overtaken in a fault, they're actually doing something wrong. You can look at it, you can judge it, and you can say, that's wrong. Do they say, ostracize that person? Is that what the Bible's teaching us to do and point fingers and talk about them with other people in the church and say, can you believe that, that Mr. So-and-so and Mrs. So-and-so are doing this and doing that? No, no, that's not what it says. It actually says, restore such an one in the spirit of me. When you see someone that that's, that's, has a fault, that has a problem, you're supposed to lovingly try to help that person out. It says, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. You'll make sure, especially when it's a fault would be like a sin. I mean, they're involved in some sin. Don't get so close and, and intimate in the situation where now you're going to be potentially, you know, falling into a sin also with that person. You know, consider yourself, but, but try to help them to, to overcome that sin that they're overtaken by. And it says in verse 2, bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. This is the spirit and the attitude that we ought to have in church is one that's looking out for each other, not condemning one another, not looking down on, on other people. Turn, if you would, to Isaiah chapter 65. Everybody's heard this holier than thou phrase and, and, and that term. And that term actually comes from Scripture. It comes from the Bible. And it's found in Isaiah chapter 65. 
Now, again, what, what I'm trying to seek here is the right balance because we don't, we definitely don't want to have and shouldn't have a holier than thou attitude. But at the same time, there is room for judgment when it comes to sin, when it comes to what God's word says. And the way we balance that is by having the right spirit. Look at Isaiah 65, verse number two. The Bible says, I have spread out my hands all the day unto a rebellious people, which walketh in a way that was not good after their own thoughts. A people that provoketh me to anger continually to my face, that sacrificeth in gardens and burneth incense upon altars of brick. So before we even continue reading here, he's saying, this is basically God saying, I've spread out my hands all day unto a rebellious people. So he's trying to reach them. He's extending his hand and they're just being rebellious. But look, this is a spiritual people. They're offering sacrifices. They're burning incense, right? They think that they are just so godly and so righteous and so spiritual. And God's actually trying to help them. He's been long suffering with them through this attitude saying they're just rebellious though. Why? Because they're not doing things the way that he said to do them. They're out in the gardens and making their sacrifices there. They're burning incense upon altars. They're not doing it the way that he prescribed to the Lord. Uh, it says in verse 4, which remain among the graves and lodge in the monuments, which eat swine's flesh and broth of abominable things is in their vessels. So they're not observing God's commands basically at all. They're just doing everything their own way, yet they think they're so spiritual. And then it says in verse number five, which say, stand by thyself, come not near to me, for I am holier than thou. This is the attitude that they had. Oh, wait, wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. Hey, don't get too close there, buddy. You're, you're, you're a sinner. You know, I don't, I don't want any of your filth to rub off on me and just having this attitude. Don't come near me. Stand back. I'm the man of God. You t did you touch my arm? <laughs> Do you know how much it costs to get this dry clean? Now I got to go and get this clean. Don't you come. This is the attitude. It's the attitude of, of you know, the, the poor man that comes in as the Bible talks about, he says, you know, don't give respect to the person wearing the gay clothing, the person who comes in that's fancy and dressed up. But then the poor guy that comes in, oh, yeah, sta you know, stand now there, sit here under my footstool. And you start being a respecter of persons and judging unrighteously just based on their, the way they're dressed or based on how much money a person has. That's wicked. That's wrong. And when you have a holier than thou attitude, as it says here in verse number five, this is how God feels about them. It says, they, these are a smoke in my nose, a fire that burneth all the day. It's not pleasant to just get some smoke inhaled up your nose. It makes you cough, makes you choke. It's really irritating, right? And this is the way that God is describing. People have this holier than thou attitude thinking that they're so much better than everyone else and I'm so spiritual and I've got everything together and you guys don't have anything together. You've got so many problems. Just stay away from me. I don't want to have any of your problems. Whereas the scripture says, try to help that person overcome, bear you one another's burdens. They're saying, no, no, no. Let's just avoid that person. Let's just stand back and not have anything to do with that person. This type of an attitude makes God angry. And you know what? It makes me angry also. Right. This is not what I want to see in our church. Nobody here is perfect. And some people may have more problems than others. But we need to recognize our role and have the spirit of long suffering and grace to be able to help people to grow. I've seen, again, I've seen this happen. It's not unique to any one church because it's really common among people in general. And the more, again, the more you have people come together, I've seen this happen over the years, over the years. And I've seen a pattern of people that have a very high opinion of themselves and how righteous they are. And they're always inspecting other people and maybe even really talking down about unsaved people. They're always talking about how these unsaved people this and the unsaved people that and, and, and I'm so lifted up. 
Yet, the vast majority of time when I've run across people like this, they've got a big old beam in their eye of not even making church attendance a priority. You'll see them every once in a while, but they've got this big, you know, they, they are the first ones to say about how wicked this person, how wicked that is, and all this other stuff, and I'm so righteous, I understand this stuff, and you can't even make it to church. One of the most basic things. But they'll tell you all day long about all these problems that everybody else has. And this is what I'm saying, you need to check yourself. Maybe you could learn something from the person that seems to have a lot of problems, but it's actually showing up faithfully every single church service and growing spiritually. Because I'd much rather spend my time with the person who's trying to do right, who's trying to serve God, who's showing up, they're here, they're trying to get involved, they're doing the best that they can. Maybe they do have a lot of problems, but I'd much rather spend my time with the person who's on that trek of, of growth spiritually than the person who's just talking, just talking a bunch of smack and can't even make it to church. You know, the Bible tells us the sins that we should shun people for in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And I believe in those things. I preached on them. And this church will not tolerate someone who's called a brother being guilty of any of the sins mentioned in that passage. If they're a railer or a drunkard or covetous or a fornicator, okay, these things we're not going to stand for. We're not going to allow it. And you know what that is? That's judgment. But that's the righteous judgment. I don't need to hear the story as to why you're a drunkard if you're called a brother, that is what it is. Now, you may have a lot of things that led you that way. I understand that. But at the end of the day, when you're doing just something that's sinful, that's wrong, and the Bible says we need to make a judgment on that, and he doesn't say that you have to know the whole backstory as to why you're a drunkard now. Just don't be a drunkard. It's that simple. But do you see, do you notice how there's a big difference between that and being concerned about someone else's kids or be, you know, like, like just having these other smaller petty problems that can go along with having a judgmental attitude. And that's what I'm trying to differentiate between is that, um, you know, you don't have to be best buddies with everybody in church. People have different personalities. You're going to get along with certain people more than others, and that's fine. I don't expect everybody to just be friends with each other and go hang out and do things outside church, but I do expect everybody that's a brother or sister of Christ to love each other. Amen. That's what I expect, and that's what the Bible says. Turn, if you would, to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. We are required to love our brothers and sisters in Christ. When you love somebody, you're going to care about that person. This is why when someone that you love, a brother or sister in Christ, someone who's called a brother, is guilty of a really grievous sin, this is why you cut the ties and you shun those people is because you love them and that is more of an extreme measure that you have to take to try to get through to that person to understand hey we really can't endorse what you're doing this is really bad and you need to understand this and we're not just going to pretend like this isn't happening and allow you to continue this way because we love you Amen. so it is more of a tough love but this is what the bible prescribes is the right thing to do and you, yes you can still love those people but that's what the action that needs to be taken, right? Versus someone who's just overtaken with a fault that it's not, they're a drunk, they're not, you know. You try to help and restore that person. Why? Because you love them. And what we shouldn't be doing, though, is shunning people that may be overtaken with a fault or may have some other problems and just, you know, you shun people only for the right reasons that the Bible lays out. Other than that, you don't just practice. I don't want to see anyone practicing just, just shunning or, God forbid, people just feeling not welcome to show up to activities or to, or to do something because they feel like nobody wants them there. That's wicked. 
First Peter chapter 1, look at verse number 22. God's words are always way more powerful than my own. Look at verse number 22. Seeing ye have purified your souls and obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. See that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. That word unfeigned love of the brethren, that means it's not a fake. It's not a facade. It's not just I'm pretending to love this person, but I don't really love this person unfeigned love of the brethren is what we're supposed to have. You're not supposed to be pretentious in, in placating someone or, or just talking down to someone as if you love them. No, we ought to really love people. And if you have a problem with loving your brother and sister in Christ, then you really need to look at your heart and try to get to the, to the, to the root of that problem. And I recommend this because as I said, people are different. People have, have different, you know, personalities or whatever that might cause you not to necessarily be friends with someone. But if, there's, if you have people that you don't, uh, that you feel like, I don't feel like I love that person, but they are a brother in Christ. They're a sister in Christ. I recommend that you go home and you pray for that person. And you spend time thinking about that person and thinking about their life and thinking about what can I pray for this person? What's going on? Because that's going to help you to care more about that person. That's one of the reasons why we have these, these prayer lists. Obviously, we believe prayer works, but I also think that we need to be concerned with other people in the church. Hey, how are you doing? How's everything going? Because you care about them, because you love them, because you want good things for them, because you're a brother or sister in Christ. And he says, not only to have unfeigned love of the brethren, he says, see that you love one another with a pure heart, fervently. It's not something that's just, yeah, I love them. Having a pure heart fervently. Um, this, is, this is the type of love that the Bible is explaining that we need to have. Fervent is active. It's, it's intense. Flip over to Ephesians chapter 4. It's the last place I'll ever turn. It is going to be a shorter sermon. <laughs> We're on the last passage already. Ephesians chapter 4. The Bible teaches we need to have unity within the church and the way that we're going to have unity is having the right spirit having humility having grace having long suffering jesus is the example for this jesus is the one who shed his shed his blood on the cross he went through all the pain and the suffering he did all the hard work he did everything for us and if you just take a step back and think about all of your own sins in your life and where you're at today and I don't see how anybody that's saved can look at their life and think about all their sins and say God hasn't been really, really, really long-suffering with me and, and been really gracious with me to allow me to get to the point where I'm at right now. I don't deserve any of this. Because I don't know about you, but that's the way that I feel when I think about my own sins. And you think about the things that you do probably on a daily basis. And then you're going to sit there and look down on other people, brothers and sisters, and just, you know, start judging them. Look, wrong attitude. Yeah, that's good. Wrong attitude. Look at verse number one, Ephesians chapter four. The Bible says, I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. Hey, I'm beseeching you that you walk worthy. Walk. That means you're doing. That means this is the way that you live. This is the way that you're walking. You need to walk worthy of the vocation, the job that you've been called to do. Verse number two, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. That's what we're endeavoring to do. That's what we're trying to do. This is how we ought to be walking. We need to have that humble mind. Be meek. 
be long suffering, be forbearing to one another. This is the attitude, look, this is the attitude that has to be in a church. That's a family integrated church, by the way. We believe in having all the kids together in one place. As a result of that, you know what's going to happen from time to time? There's going to be some disruptions. Now look, parents should be watching their kids and not allowing them to make disruptions in church. They should be taking them out. They should be taking care of them. That's their job. That's what they should be doing. But you know what? On the other hand, it's going to happen. It is going to happen. And we need to be able to show the grace necessary. And look, if things get out of control, I'll deal with it. So no one else has to worry about, you know, when it, this, this whole place turning into a circus because nobody's watching their kids. All right? And if you could, if you could trust me to do that, then you don't have to worry about just casting your judgment on everyone else and especially allowing that to, to become a problem in your heart. Everybody has different problems that they have to deal with. And everybody's trying to grow here. And I believe that. I don't think there's anybody that's coming to the church that isn't trying to do better and, and grow and, and continue. So let's help people to grow. Verse number 11, jump down to verse number 11. Here's the last few verses, and then we're done. The Bible says, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. God wants us to be in unity, to have the unity of the faith, to believe the same things, to be in one accord, to be acting as a body, which is what the church is. You can't have the body, you know, fighting against each other and having all these problems with other, with other body members, right? The body's not going to be working very well in unison that way. Everybody needs to be in one accord, in one place, and having the right spirit that allows for grace and long-suffering and mercy so that we can all remember what's truly important and why we're here. So, and you know what? I don't, I think we have a great church here, too. I mean, it's, uh, I, I'm, you know, I'd rather preach really hard on something and try to make sure that this stuff doesn't become, you know, get a foothold and start to become a problem. I think everybody here is great. And I, and I honestly mean that. And I believe that I'm looking around in everybody's faces right now. I think everybody here is, is really intent on trying to do what's right and serve the Lord. And this church has, a, I mean, you guys have a good reputation already from people who have come and visited. And amen, praise the Lord for that. And I want to make sure things continue to be that way. Let's continue to grow. Let's continue to be strong. Let's show our love for one another within the church and our love for the lost by going out and preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is ultimately the whole point and the goal of us being here. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for uh, the grace and the long-suffering and the mercy that you've extended unto us, Lord. I pray that you would please help us to have the right balance in our life that, yes, we need to be able to judge. We need to be able to judge righteously and, and be able to um, not back down and not be watered down when it comes to the right judgment, Lord. But help us to have the right judgment. God, I pray that you please help us not to judge too quickly or, or be too rash and not just look at the surface, but understand the whole picture, Lord. And, and I pray that you please help our church to grow and to be unified. And um, God, we love you and, and we're trying to do our best for you. It's in Jesus' name we pray.